Shalom, everyone. This is Ty Green. I want to encourage you as we watch the word of the Lord unfold before our very eyes, as we study scripture of the end times, then observe it to see if it be so. Please don't forget everything that we've learned along the way, because it's all connected. One thing doesn't negate the other. There's no contradiction of scripture. It all happens just like scripture says in its season or in its area upon the earth. We see this repeatedly within biblical prophecy. The case in point here is a normalized world just before the rapture, but simultaneously there's big events happening all over the world. Look at this in Matthew chapter 24, 38 and 39. For as in the days of Noah that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. See, life is still going on. Normal is different now, but folks are still eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. I want you to see this because at the same time we're seeing everything that the fig tree generation is supposed to see before the rapture of the church. This also includes this global pestilence. Our Lord Jesus Christ says it right here. Matthew 24, verses 7 and 8. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. And we're in this time frame right now. We know this because here's what comes next. Look at the very next verse, verse 9 of Matthew 24. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Now, we know that's in the tribulation, right? We see more evidence of that further down within scripture here in the 15th verse. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, the prophet, Stand in the holy place, whosoever readeth, let him understand. So, even though folks are still eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, this connects to an element of normalcy. At the same time, some other significant events are happening. This includes, but is not limited to the wounded head of Revelation 13.3, so as we observe this, remember only one of those seven heads are wounded to death. The rest of the heads are fine. Doesn't negate the normalcy of eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. Let's be clear. The woman riding the beast and six of the seven heads of the beast have a degree of normalcy. The wounded head suffers from a blow stripe a wound, the public calamity, heavy affliction, the plague, right? If we can't see the forest from the trees, one can miss this very important detail. This makes more sense as a follow-up to the last video, is the collapse related to the crisis in India or Brazil? And it's looking more like India than Brazil presently. So. Please don't be discouraged. We're covering the less popular details of what happens during the end times. And I want to encourage you to see this for yourselves. It's been there. Now, it's still a rapture before the tribulation. Don't worry. Still a rapture before the revealing of the Antichrist. Rest assured, we're going vertical soon. Jesus Christ is coming for those that belong to him. Those in Christ be encouraged. 
Now, I know folks are ready to go. But remember 2 Peter 3 and 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. If you don't know the Lord, know that he's long-suffering to usward, meaning that he is being patient with us, slow to anger, slow to punish. Says it right here when we define this word in the Bible concordance. Perish, right? He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He doesn't want you or I to perish. Jesus said it himself. John 3, 16 and 17, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish. There it is, right there that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But saved from what? Because folks still don't see the need for a savior. Some folks. But we all need Jesus. See, folks don't realize that sin is an offense to God. For God is holy. And there's a penalty for sin the death penalty. We can't act like it doesn't exist. This is the perishing. The Thayer lexicon defines this as, right for this verse, to destroy, to put out of the way entirely abolish, to put an end to ruin, render useless to kill, to declare that one must be put to death. Metaphorically, to devote or give over to eternal misery in hell. To perish, to be lost, ruined, destroyed. I don't want you to perish. I don't want you to be lost, ruined, or destroyed. But none of us can do anything except point you to the one that can keep you from perishing or being lost, ruined, or destroyed. And that one is Jesus Christ. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Romans 6 and 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we can receive this gift when we confess the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead. We will be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. All right, trust in the Lord. Some big events coming up, folks. But God is in control. Love y'all. Shalom. Shalom.